Our nafs is our greatest enemy. Our nafs is our most deceptive enemy. Our nafs is our most constant enemy. Our nafs is that part of us that keeps making us fall down over and over and over again. Every time we pick ourselves up and fall back down, it is due to our nafs. Two enemies, Allah Ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran, nafs and shaitan. The shaitan himself, how did Iblis, Azazil, Iblis become shaitan? There was no shaitan on shaitan that made him shaitan. Iblis became shaitan because of his nafs. Just from this one example, we can understand how devastating a person's nafs can be. Iblis and Azazil, he was that jinn who did so much ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thousands of years of ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He got the level of the qurb of the malaikatul muqarrabun. He was so near and close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iblis was that jinn who Allah Ta'ala called him to his presence when he created Sayyidina Adam alayhi salam. Iblis was that jinn who was able to see Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala Ru'yati Bari Ta'ala Didarullah. Iblis was that jinn who heard Allah Ta'ala Kalamullah in his own ears directly when Allah Ta'ala said Fasjudu. He was looking at Allah Ta'ala, hearing Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala so close to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala but his nafs brought him all the way from there all the way down to the lowest of all of creation. The most regime, the most mardub, the most dhalil of the entire creation that Allah Ta'ala, the Creator has made, is shaitan. How did he make that journey from his nafs? Nothing else. There was no other force, no other factor, no other enemy that one nafs took him from one of the highest states to the lowest state ever. Now just from this one example we can understand what an incredible enemy our nafs is. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Qur'an al-Karim to give it even further emphasis, ta'teeb, the most number, highest number of consecutive qasm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken in Qur'an is about the nafs. وَالشَّمْسِ وَدُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تُلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا صَوَاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Allah SWT took seven oaths in Qur'an al-Karim Seven. All of that to come to this point, what was the purpose of the qasam? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا That successful and joyous and victorious indeed and only can be that person, man, any and every person, zakkaha who purifies their nafs. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا and abased and degraced will be that person 
who is spoiled by their nafs. Means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a simple thing. If we want falah, we have to do something called tazkiyatun nafs. We have to train and discipline and purify and develop our nafs. What is falah? In the Arabic language, this word falah, literally it means that when something is hidden, to manifest it. So that's why in colloquial Arabic, this word, in classical Islam, this word was used for farming. That hidden in the land and the ground is this potential to manifest into crops and vegetation and fruit or flowers or trees. All of that potential is hidden in the land. So to make something that is hidden, to make it manifest, that is called talaq in the Arabic language. What is the sense this word has been used in our deen? Number one, al-falah has been used for yawm al-deen. That on the day of judgment, what was hidden inside of us, not the sudur, that what we were hiding in our breasts, what we were hiding in our book of deeds, what we were hiding in our life, all of that will be open and manifested and shown to the whole world on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open up our book of deeds. Second way the word falah has been used is in this sense. Kad aflaha al-mu'minun, ula'akuhum al-muflihum, kad aflaha man zakkaha, hayya ala al-falah. What does that falah mean? Falah in that sense means that success and victory after which they can never be free. Means that falah that is called afla. <coughs> Such a triumphant, <coughs> joyful success after which they can never be failure, never regress. Falah means that that level of izza, that honor and dignity, after which a person can never fall in disgrace. Falah means that qurubul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after which a person never gets bu'ad, a person gets close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a way that they can never become distant from Him again. All of this is falah. In many places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned falah in Qur'an, three core ayat of Qur'ani where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned falah. Number one, Tubu ila Allahi jami'a ayyuhal mu'minun la'allakum tuflihu That make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jami'a all together entirely, O believers, la'allakum tuflihu so that you may have falah. So what do we learn from this ayah? Tawbah leads to falah. Repenting and renouncing all of our sin that will lead us to such a success, such a joy, such a nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will cross the point of no return. This is our problem that we're not able to reach that point. We reach a level of taqwa, but we can't reach that taqwa from which there is no return. We have a moment of taqwa, a day of taqwa, a month of Ramadan of taqwa, but then we return back into our sin. فَأَلْحَمَهَا فَجُولَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا We want to reach such a level, such a point of taqwa to which there is no return to fujur. That is called falah. So first step, the <coughs> way to get that falah Allah Ta'ala mentioned in Qur'an is tawbah. <coughs> Then in this ayah, kan aflaha man zakkaha. In another ayah, kan aflaha man tazakka. Means second way to reach that falah is tazkiya. Tazkiya is to keep purifying, keep purifying, spending our whole life. Don't we spend our whole life in our physical purity? We spend our whole life washing ourselves every day from the surface dirt that we have. Imagine how much purification we need for the spiritual inner dirt that we have, for the filth of our sins, for the sinful thoughts that we think, for the impure feelings that we have, for the sinful desires that we wish. Allah Akbar. Even if just one day's thoughts of ours were shown to the world, we would be ashamed. What's going to happen on that day of judgment when years and years of thoughts will be in front of people? Years and years of their desires will be in front of people. Tamam khalaf khaishat sab ke samne kholay jayenge. What are we going to do on that day? Allah Akbar ke mila. So tazkiyah means always cleaning, always scrubbing, always purifying. And if a person is always getting dirty, then they must always keep cleaning. 
So first was Tawbah, second was Tazkiyah. And then in Surah Mu'minun, Allah SWT said, Kat aflaha al mu'minun That indeed those believers are triumphantly successful and joyful. And then in that passage of Qur'an, Allah Ta'ala mentioned the takhil of Salah. Broad feelings, Tawbah and Tazkiyah. Then in that passage, Allah Ta'ala mentioned some details, such as Allah Dina Hum Fi Salat in Khashi'ur, that they are those who are humbly fearful of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala inside their Salah. So this gives us another big feeling, Khashiyya. That person who fears Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, who has awe and reverence for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, who is humbled out of that fear of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, that person will have Salah. Tawbah, Tazkiyah, Khashiyah, and then the fourth ayah, وَمَنْ يُوْقَ شُحْقَ نَفْسِهِ That that person who is able to save themselves from the shuh, from the shuh of their nafs. What does that mean? From the miserliness and the covetousness and the stinginess of their nafs. فَأُولَاكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And this is a stronger form in Arabic. Those of our ulama who know Malaga, one thing is to say, كَنْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ and one thing is to say, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِهُمْ Allahu Akbar Much stronger in meaning, much more robust in meaning, means the fourth ayah then is that person who is able to save themselves from their nafs, they become amongst the muflihun. Muflihun are those people who falah has become a very part of them. It's an inseparable attribute. غَيْرْ مُنْفَقْ sifat. This is the structure of Arabic language. Sabirin, people who always have sabr. Zakirin, people who always do dhikr. Muflihun, people who are always on falah. Means even in this world, they get that ni'mah of al-falah. Such a person who has saved themselves from the tricks and the desires and the deceptions of their nafs. So it means that if we discipline and train our nafs, we can become muflihun. And if we fall prey to our nafs, then we will be following the path of Iblis and Shaitan. So we understand from all of this then, how and why important it, how important it is, and why it is so important to control our nafs. Next question is, that what is the nafs? What exactly is this nafs that I have to discipline and train? So you should understand that every human being has two aspects. One is our zahir, our physical self. That is our jism, our jism, our bodily self. And second, we have a batin. And there are three major elements in the batin that Allah SWT has mentioned in the Quran. First element is our aql, our mind. That is the seat of our thoughts. Aql, mahal khayalat. It is the seat of our thoughts. Second is our nafs, that's in our body, that's inside of us. And nafs is the seat of our desires and passions. Mahalli, khaishat. And third we have our qalb. Qalb is where we have feelings and emotions. So aql is for the thoughts, nafs is for the desires, and the qalb is for the feelings and emotions that we have. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Qur'an, إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّالُكُمْ بِسُوءٍ That indeed the nafs is all commanding, supremely commanding us to do evil. And what was our response to that amr? Our response was supposed to be, وَنَحَنْ نَفْسَ عَنِ الْحَوَى That we do nahi, we prohibit that nafs. We stop that nafs from what? Here Allah ta'ala didn't say, عَنِ السُوءٍ the nafs is going to command us to do sin in order to stop it. We're not going to stop it from doing sin only. We have to stop it from following its desire entirely. We will stop the nafs from its whims and desires, from its wishes and passions. Only when we stop it entirely from all of its wishes and desires and whims and passions, we will be able to stay away from its command for us to do sin. So there's one type of person who has nafsi amara. What does that mean? That that is that mu'min that all the time they're slave to their passions. That they say in English, a slave to one's passions, a creature of one's desires. Whatever the nafs wants, they do it. 
They are abdul nafs. They become the servant and slave to the nafs. Then Allah Ta'ala mentions the second category of nafs in Quran called nafs al-lawwama. Lawwama means the person who is recriminating, blaming themselves. Means they do sin but they feel bad. They're upset with themselves. They're upset. Why did I do sin? I was supposed to be a person of taqwa. Why did I slip? This is called lawwama. And lawwam is also mubalaga. It's a very good thing. It means that they're always blaming themselves. Every single time there's sin, they feel guilty. Every single time there's sin, they have remorse, regret, and shame. They never do a sin shamelessly. This is also a great daraja, actually, which is beyond most of us. Most of us are stuck in amara, or at best between amara and lawama. In the earlier period, mutmina was the rank. In this day and age, even lawama is a rank. Yes? How many of us do sin, we don't feel shame? We sleep through Fajr, we wake up, we look at our clock and we say, okay, I have to go to work. We should have stopped that day, we should have been crying. We should have been tearing our hair out. What happened to me? How can I show my face at work? How can I go collect the risk of that al-razaq is sent down on me when I didn't pray the sajda that Allah Ta'ala demanded of me? How can I do that? I should be ashamed. We don't have that shame. Sometimes people, they sleep through Fajr and they look at their clock and they see it's 8.30 a.m. So they're running late for work. So they have two options. Either they can make qada of their fajr or they can have breakfast. They don't have time to do both. 90% of people who miss fajr, they choose to eat breakfast. They don't even make their qada. They'd rather eat their breakfast than make up the fajr that they missed. Why? Because they think the breakfast will make me strong enough to work. You took the strength of bread and butter and you left the strength of ruku and sajda? You think you're going to have barakah in your life because of that? That's going to be a barakah filled day at work? Hmm? Allah Akbar. We're using our akal. Foolish akal. Deceiving akal. That would teach somebody to do something like that. Nafs al-Lawama is that person they cannot do anything until they have missed, made up that Fajr. Yes, they missed the Fajr, so they committed a sin. But the Lawama, they're so upset with themselves, they must first repent from sin, make up for that sin, and only then can they move on. This is a big daraja, big daraja, big level of achievement in our day. Then there is another type of nafs that Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an. Ya ayyatuhan nafsin mutma'inna. Nafsin mutma'inna. Who is that nafs? Mutma'in means two things. Number one, it means that they're mutma'in on sharia. They're completely happy and content with sharia. So all of us had this in Ramadan as an example. When Allah Ta'ala told us to fast, we were happy. When we stayed away from food and drink, we were completely happy. We never thought of cheating. I don't think anybody here ever in their fast thought that, okay, I will secretly go into the closet and take a few bites. We were completely mutmain. Nobody ever thought during wudu, I'll take a few gulps. We were completely mutmain. Nafsi mutmainna is that person who is as content in every single hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as me and you were content in fasting in Ramadan. You're happy with every single thing Allah Ta'ala is happy with. So then because they get this itminan, they get a second type of itminan, and that is called sukoon. They get peace and tranquility and contentment. They enjoy this life. They're enjoying because they're pleasing Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That is the source of their enjoyment. And anything that is displeasing to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gives them no enjoyment whatsoever. So this is what the nafs is. What are the desires that the nafs has? We told you that nafs is the seat of desires. Aql is the seat of our thoughts. Qalb is the seat of our emotions. So what are the desires the nafs has? Number one, this word in Quran, hawa. <laughs> 
how much does he become a slave? Allah Ta'ala says that do you not gaze in wonder and amazement at that person who has taken their hawa as their God? Ya Allah. Allah Ta'ala was supposed to be God. This person has made their hawa. What does it mean? Whatever they wish. Fancy word in English for this is capricious. They're capricious. They just follow their whims and desires. Whatever. Kabi jahan marzi. And this is the entire philosophy that secularism has tried to spread in humanity. Do whatever makes you happy. Do whatever you want. Do whatever you feel like doing. Do whatever you are inclined towards doing. All of that is hawa. They're trying to give a gift wrapping to what Allah Ta'ala said in Quran. They're taking the hawa as ilah. And many Muslims are thinking the same way. What's wrong if I do what I like? What's wrong if I do what I want? Allah hmm? Akbar. We were created and we exist to do what Allah Ta'ala likes and what Allah Ta'ala wants. We have no reality other than that. We have no authority to do what we like and what we want. We've been created to do what Allah Ta'ala likes and what Allah Ta'ala wants. Yes, if a person can make what they like and want, the same thing that Allah Ta'ala likes and wants, then you can do what you like and what you want. So this first thing is called Hawa. What aspect of Hawa is lust? This is the number one sinful desire of the nafs. The number one weapon of the nafs. And in this day and age, young and old are almost equal now. In earlier times, younger people had this problem. And as they grow older, they got rid of this problem. But in this day and age, 21st century Muslim, hmm? Allah Akbar, can be even nearing one century of age and still has this problem. Lust, unlawful, lustful desire for someone of the opposite gender. Those feelings come from the person's nafs. So much nafs, they can just hear a couple of words to have desire. They can smell some fragrance of perfume, have desire. This is why our deen has said to the women, they should not show perf wear the perfume for the men. Why? Because that man is carrying a big nafs with him. Such a big nafs. And if you're living in a society, a society of nafs, it's going to be very difficult not to become an individual of nafs when you live in a society of nafs means when the society gives in to every lustful desire, when the society celebrates lust, how are you going to, as an individual, be able to stay away from lust unless you have tazkiyah, unless you do something to protect yourself and purify yourself from that lustful desire? Second feeling of nafs is arrogance. Like this, like this, fi anfusih that they had arrogance in their nafs. Here nafs means their self, but you can also understand it that they had arrogance in their nafs. Anger comes from arrogance. Envy comes from arrogance. This is the problem that shaitan had. His Qutamar and his hasad and his ghil for Sayyidina Adam is what brought him down. What part of him was having those feelings? Was it his ruh? No. Was it his qalb? No. Was it his akal? No. It was his nafs that felt his arrogance and envy for Sayyidina Adam The third feeling, <coughs> third master sin of the nafs is this word called shuh. What does shuh mean? I want to explain this to you. Shuh is a special type of bukhal. Shuh is a very particular way of being stingy. What is that? That when the qalb wants to do something, when your heart wants to do something, and then your nafs stands up and is stingy with you, that is called shuk. Example, you want to give charity in your heart. You take out some money from your drawer, you put it in the envelope. Your heart felt completely happy giving that charity. Your nafs stands up, starts telling you, do you really need to give so much? Maybe you should put a little bit back while well, that envelope is feeling a bit heavy in your hand. Hmm? So what is that? That's called shuh in Arabic. 
that specific miserliness of the nafs, that takes place when the kalb wanted to do something. I'll give you another example. Your kalb wants to pray tahajjud. You set your alarm for tahajjud. The alarm goes off. You wake up because of that alarm. Your heart is happy. It wants to pray tahajjud. The nafs stands up. Shock. Nafs becomes miserly when you have heartfelt. Nafs says you should just keep sleeping. You should keep lying down. Your heart wants to do it. Your nafs stands up and convinces it not to do it. Allah Akbar. This is also a devastating aspect of the nafs. You want to do something good. Your kalb says, I want to go to some program. I want to spend some time in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to do this, something khair, some amal is saleh. The nafs stands up. Your heart was completely genuine, completely sincere intention. The nafs stands up and tries to prevent you from doing it. That is called shuk. How many good intentions did we make in Ramadan? And we made them truly, and we made them sincerely, and we were genuine. But we weren't able to follow through. We don't have follow through. What is it in us that stops us from the following through on the sincere emotions of our kalb? That's the shuk of the nafs. Look at this devastating nafs. Look at this sinister nafs. It stops us from even doing our heartfelt desire to do good. That's how the Swamta said, Mayuka, that person who gets Bekai, who is able to become saved, who saves themselves, who is saved and refrains from the shock of their nafs, they will become amongst the Muslims because they had Iman. If they had Iman in their heart, they would always desire to do Amal Saleh. They just have to put down this nuff that keeps rearing its ugly head and tries to dissuade them from doing what is right. This is our story. Now you understand this ayah that Masha'Allah the Imam recited in second rakah of Salah tonight as well. We have become victims of the shock of our nafs. Every time we want to do good, it stands up and brings us back down. Sometimes with a rationalization, sometimes with justification, sometimes with excuse, with other, keep pulling us back down. That's why we're not able to become muflihun on this earth. Whether as individuals, families, communities, societies, as an ummah, we're not able to do it. Because we keep falling into the shock of our nafs. Now I will show you that nafs is even more sinister than shaitan. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about shaitan in the Quran, Allah ta'ala said, Inna kaida shaitani, inna kaida shaitani kana zaifa. That indeed the planning and sinister planning and plotting of shaitan is zaif, it is weak. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran al-Kareem narrates an incident about nafs, Inna kaida kunna adeem. That indeed your planning, this is referring to some women who had nafs, that your planning was azim. So the planning of the nafs is called azim in Quran, and the planning of shaitan is called zaif in Quran. So what does it mean? Which one is our real enemy? That zaif one or azim one? Our real enemy is our nafs. In fact, 95% of sins that we do is due to our nafs. And it's only 5% that we do, do which is due to shaitan. And even that 5% we do that is due to shaitan, that's also because of our nafs. Because shaitan can do one thing only, and that's called waswas. He can whisper, insinuate, implant something, suggest something. Which part of us is the one that listens to the suggestion of shaitan? That is called nafs. It's impo nothing else listens to shaitan, it's our nafs that listens to shaitan. Our nafs is shaitan's double agent. And you know the nafs, it is so dangerous. Why? Because the nafs is always with us. It's always there. It's internal, it's part of us, it's in our body. Imagine that enemy, shaitan Iblis, who hates us so much. Allah oh, says in the Quran, that he is aduvum mubin. He is a clear, open, manifest enemy. Allah Ta'ala says in Quran, fattakhiduhu aduwa. You should take him as an enemy. Now I want you to think, in your life, if somebody was your enemy, somebody is mean to you at work, some neighbor is trying to harm you, how worried do you get, right? 
let's say you, get, you gain certain knowledge that somebody is plotting against you. You get so worried about that little human being who has a little bit of enmity towards you. Now I want you to think, know that shaitan has more enmity for each and every single one of you and me than all of the human enemies we could ever have combined. He was Allah Ta'ala saying he's our adu. So then how careful and watchful should you be against him? If you're so careful and watchful over the single human enemy you may have, how watchful and careful should you be over the enemy called shaitan? And from all of the Bani Adam, the ones he has the most enmity for is the Ummat al-Mustafa Most enmity. And from the Ummat al-Mustafa the ones he has even more enmity for are the Musalleen Mu'mineen. Yes. Who are doing that very sajda that he was not able to do. Sajda of the hukam of Allah SWT. So you have to feel that shaitan is my die-hard enemy. Now go back to the nafs. Imagine there was some human being who was your die-hard enemy. And he had a double agent inside of you. Allah, what would you think? So shaitan is your die-hard enemy and your nafs amala is his secret agent. Allah, now you see why we fall into sin. Why we slip and we fail? Hmm? The nafs is very dangerous. But we are so foolish. We have made our nafs our mahboob. Yes? We are nurturing the nafs. Hum nafs ko paal paal kar takte. Or wo hume guna karwa karwa kar nahi takte. Yes? What does it mean in English? We are nurturing our nafs. We are the caretakers of our nafs. We feed our nafs extra food. We give in to the desires of our nafs. In fact, our nafs is our mahbu. We love our nafs. And love blinds the person to its faults. This is what a person, young man, says. That I don't know what happened to me. I was overwhelmed with desire. Now Allah, you were in sani mu'min. You were supposed to be overwhelmed by taqwa. You were supposed to be overwhelmed by fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You were supposed to be overwhelmed by love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do you mean you were overwhelmed by some lustful desire? What type of insan and mu'min is that? That's what they say. They say, I lost my control. Allah. I lost my control over myself. You were supposed to be mu'min. You are on Sirat al Mustaqeem. You have every tool to have control over yourself. How could you lose control? So I lost control. Allah. Losing control. Losing control means we've been losing the quality of our Imam. We've been losing the nur of our Imam. But now comes the question on how to control our nafs. How to control this nafs. I don't want to lose control. I want to have control. I don't want to be Abdul Nafs. I want to be what the Arab call Abu Nafs. I want to be the master over the Nafs. I drive the Nafs. I should control the Nafs. How can a person get that control? The way to control the Nafs is to operate the control room. The control room is called the Qalb. The Qalb controls the Aqal and the Nafs. Let me explain. Whatever emotions and feelings a person has, based on that a person will have thoughts, and based on that a person will have desires. So let's take the ultimate sin. So lust, where did that lustful desire come from? Because you allowed yourself to have some romantic feeling for someone. Once you let yourself have that romantic feeling in your heart for someone, so the nafs looks at that and it has its desires. Your mind looks at that and keeps having thoughts about that someone. First, Majnoon loved Layla. Then he desired and was always thinking about Layla. So a mistake he made, he allowed himself to fall for Layla. Once that happened, he lost control. Yes, he lost control. Once you let go of the calm, you lose control. 
What does the man do here? So he notices the colleague, he notices the nurse, he notices the customer, he notices the teacher. He lets himself loose in his kalp. He lets himself have some romantic feeling for her. Well, the second you lose control of your kalp, you're going to lose all control on your akal and your nafs. Then you will say that, oh, I have such dirty thoughts and I have such dirty desires because you allowed yourself to feel a dirty feeling. So if we can control the control room, if we can purify our kalb, <laughs> then we will automatically be controlling our nafs and our aql. So let me give you the other example. What we explained to you in Jummah. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَنُّ حُمَّا لِلَّهِ That those who have iman, what is the feeling in their kalb? That they're extremely intense, intensely extreme in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When that feeling comes into the kalb, then the nafs looks at them. Then that nafs desires, has desires. But that nafs of that person who loves Allah Ta'ala, that nafs desires to pray. That nafs, yes, nafs Muslim, that nafs desires to pray to That nafs desires to become hafiz. That nafs desires to pray long salah. That nafs desires to learn about deen. That nafs desires, nafs, that nafs desires to follow sunnah. Because the nafs is looking at the feeling in the heart. Then the akal will also look at the feeling in the heart. If the akal sees it in the kalb and the heart is love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that feeling, then the akal will always be thinking thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is called dhikrullah. The akal will always be remembering Allah ta'ala. That is called dhikrullah. Where is that going to come from? Because they have the feeling of love for Allah ta'ala in their heart. So means the way to control the nafs is to work on our kalb. And the way to work on our kalb, that is called the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لِكُلْنِ شَيْءٍ ثِقَالَ That for each and everything there is a polish that will purify it, nurture it, strengthen it. وَسِقَالَ تُلْقُلُوبِ ذِكْرُ اللَّهِ And the polish of the spiritual parts is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now you see why you need to work on the kalb. Because that's what's going to control the nafs. Or if a person says, I have bad thoughts, my akal is out of control. I can't even control my akal inside salah. If somebody says that, I have no control over my thoughts. I have lost control. How are they going to get control from their kalb? Kalb will control the akal and kalb will control the nafs. Now understand that whatever harms the nafs will be a benefit to the kalb. Whatever benefits the kalb will harm the nafs. Whatever gives life to the nafs will give death to the kalb. And whatever gives life to the kalb will give death to the nafs of Allah. That's why Sayyidina Rasulullah said in the that the likeness of that person who does the zikr of Allah SWT, he's giving life to the kalb. And the person who doesn't do the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not giving life to the kalb. Kamathal al wal mayyit is like the likeness of the living and the dead. So give life to your kalb, you will give death to nafsi ummara. And until you learn how to give life to your kalb, you will never be able to give death to nafsi ummara. Then you should know. Whatever gives pleasure to the nafs, Whatever gives lazat to the nafs will take away the lazat from the kalb. And whatever gives lazat to the kalb will take away the lazat of the nafs. Ajeeb <coughs> Bhakta. Whatever gives pleasure, lazza means pleasure. What does it mean? If you indulge yourself in pleasures of the nafs, you will lose the lazat and lutf of ibadah. You will lose the pleasures of the kalb. You will even say that, okay, I came to masjid, I read Qur'an, I prayed salah, my heart is in it. I don't feel anything in my prayer. I don't enjoy praying. The person is being honest when they're saying that. Why? Because you gave yourself up to the enjoyments of the nafs, so therefore you lost the enjoyment of the kalm. That's it. Allah Ta'ala put itminan here. 
to trust to chase it to on somewhere else. But it works the other way also. Learn and train and be trained how to feel the lazat of the kalb, then you will forget about the lazat of the nafs. Many times for younger people, we give an example that may not work in present crowd, but maybe you can understand. But because I love enjoy, I, I enjoy this example, and I love to say it, so for my own enjoyment, I will say it. I can't remember even what you, oh, I, I remember now what you have, but you can. Asta. So imagine Asta brand chocolate ice cream. And you're hooked on Asta ice cream. <coughs> and one day I come and I give you Hagen Dazs ice cream. What will happen? The day you taste Hagen Dazs chocolate ice cream, you will forget everything about Asta ice cream. Yes? What does it mean? You have to connect yourself to a higher pleasure to get unhooked from the lower pleasure. I'm telling you something sincerely from the bottom of my heart. If you feel bad about the lust, you want to leave the lust. If you feel bad about misdirecting your gaze, just feeling bad isn't going to be good enough. And you know it, because you've already felt bad about it. Just, just, just crying over it will also not be good enough. Because you know, you've cried over it. The only way to get out of this the only way to unhook yourself from the lower carnal nafs pleasure is to hook yourself onto the gul pleasure. The only way to disconnect yourself from being a creature of the nafs is to make yourself a lover of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why the mashayikh of Tazkiyah, the ulama of Tazkiyah, always talking about love for Allah. The only way you can save yourself from romantic love or fantasizing love for creation is if you fall in love with the creator. But again, go back to the vice versa. If you allow yourself to fall in love with the creation, whether it is dunya, or it is makhluk, or it is wealth, or even your own self, sometimes people love their own self, vanity and conceit. If you allow yourself to fall in love with the creation, you are at danger that maybe you will fall out of love with the Creator. And when you start losing your love for Allah SWT, then you will lose the pleasure of the Qalb. Then you will become more deep into the pleasure of the nafs. So whatever gives pleasure to the nafs will take away the pleasure of the Qalb. But Alhamdulillah, whatever gives pleasure to the Qalb will take away the pleasure of the nafs. What gives pleasure to the Qalb? Allah Ta'ala said in Quran, Allah bi dhikri Allahi tatma'innu kulu. Allah, harfi tabih, be aware, be well informed, listen intently. Bi dhikri Allah, khabar muqaddam yufeed al hasan. Bi dhikri Allah, only and only in the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Tatma'innu kulu, will the hearts be happy? Will the hearts be pleased? Yes, it's in Quran. Be aware that only and only in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the hearts will be happy. Now what you just understood is you should never view dhikr as just nothing. Why? Because only through dhikr will you get the pleasure of the kalb. Only when you have the pleasure of the kalb will you no longer need the pleasure of the nafs. And no longer needing the pleasure of the nafs for a person who is sinfully thinking about that pleasure is fard on that person. Yes? To stay away from sinful acts, to stay away from sinful thoughts, to stay away from sinful desires, all of that is fard. Allah Ta'ala said in Quran, وَذَرُوا ظَاهِرَ الْإِثْمِ وَبَعْتِنَا you must leave all the sins that you do, the zahir, outward acts of sin, wabatina, and the inner thoughts and desires of sin. So the only way we can leave the desire and pleasure of nafs is if we feel the pleasure of the kalm. The only way we can feel the pleasure of the kalm is if we do the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why the Messiah keep telling people, 
Lost to zikr. Still the person says, why? Always talking about zikr. Always turning up to zikr. Allah Ta'ala said in Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu dhkuru Allah fa zikran kafira. That oh you have iman, you must make zikr of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly, excessively. Why? What does it mean now? Retranslate. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu. Oh those of you who have brought the meanings of iman onto your tongue. If you want to get the feelings of Iman in your heart, Udhkurullah, do that activity that will give your heart so much pleasure that you will no longer be attracted to the pleasures of this world. When Allah Ta'ala said, Udhkurullah dhikran kafira, means Allah Ta'ala wants to give us lazzat kafir, lutf kafir, itminan kafir. Allah Ta'ala wants to give us tranquility, abundant tranquility. And what happened to those people who did a little dhikr inside Salah? Allah Ta'ala in Qur'an Al-Kareem talks about the munafiq, the hypocrites, and how they feel inside ibadah. لا يذكرون الله إلا قليل That they're not able to remember Allah Ta'ala except a little bit. Not zero, they had dhikr. But they had dhikr al-qadil. They had a little bit. So what does that mean? A little bit of dhikr. They had a little bit of pleasure of the heart. And then the world was offering a lot of pleasure of the nafs. So what happens to them? Hmm? What happens to such a person? They will be munafiq. They were munafiq in Iman. We are munafiq in our Islam. We say we're Muslim, but we do acts that betray our Islam. We say we have Iman, but we do acts that hurt our Iman. Why? Because we're doing little or no dhikr. Therefore getting little or no pleasure here. Therefore seeking all of the pleasures of the nafs. So the way to control the nafs is to <coughs> control it through our qalb to get the feeling of love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to get the feeling of the fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside our heart. The problem is that we can't control our nafs from our qalb is because we have a diseased qalb that we have a disease in our tongue. There's a separate entire topic, separate talk. There is one heart that is called Kalbun Mayyid, the dead heart. There's one heart called Kalbun Marid, that is the diseased heart. And there's one heart called Kalbun Sadeen. Yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun illa man atallahu li kalbin saleem. Kalbi saleem and nafsi mutmin. That's what we call happy marriage. Hmm? Yes? You want what? Nafsi amara and kalbun salim. No problem. That mika is not allowed in Islam. Kalbun salim and nafsi mutmina. That's the only mika that is allowed in Islam. You need to have a pure heart and then you will have a content nafs. So if we don't have that pure heart, that is another reason why we don't have the content nafs. Hafiz ibn Qayyim al Jazeera Allah Ta'ala. He mentioned what is the sign that a person has a sick heart? I won't even talk about dead heart tonight. What is some of the signs that a person has a sick heart? Number one, they prefer that which is funny over that which is baki. What does that mean? They prefer the temporary, fleeting, fading things in this world as opposed to the everlasting, unending, unending blessings of Akhir. They want to have a nice home here. They're not thinking that I want to have a nice home in Akhirah. How many of us actually think like that? That I want to have a better place in Akhirah. No, we just want to have a better place here. How hard have you worked for your promotion in this world? How hard have you worked for promotion in one darajah in Akhirah? Hmm? Yes, there's darajah there also. We're so busy trying to live a good life. Many times to our friends who come to these gatherings, we tell you a saying of our shaykh. I'll say it in Urdu first, and then in English for those who don't understand. My shaykh ne firmaya ki hume zindagi mein achhe zindagi jine ke liye nahi aaye. Hum is zindagi mein achhe zindagi jine ke liye nahi aaye. Hum is dunya mein achha maut manne ke liye. Maut. 
is the Messiah. All we have to do. One sentence they explain the whole matter. Sheikh said, I've translated in English, that we have not been sent to this world to live a good life. We have not been sent to this world to live a good life. We have been sent to this world to die a good death. How many of us are planning? All of our planning and effort is to live a good life. How many of us are planning and making effort to die a good death? All of you know? If you don't die a good death, it doesn't matter how good a life you live, in the materialistic sense. But if you can manage to die a good death, if any one of us could be given a certificate of good death now, everyone would be ready to go. Any moment would be ready to go. Oh, die a good death. Don't try to live a good life. This is one sign that the heart is diseased. Another sign that the heart is diseased is that we desire to meet creation, we don't have desire to meet Allah subhanahu wa This is something that Allah has mentioned in Quran. May yarju liqa Allah. That person who yearns to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They love coming to masjid. They love coming to salah. They love making dua. They love reading Quran. They love making dhikr. And they don't want to get up from this place. That's the sign of a good heart. Sign of a diseased heart. They don't like coming. They have to drag themselves to the masjid. If they come to the masjid few minutes before jama'ah, they can't come inside. They stay outside. They look and say, oh, I came three minutes early. Okay, maybe I can make one phone call. Maybe I can make two SMS. They cannot come inside. Only at the last minute, just by force, they bring themselves inside. And like we explained today, Jummah, when the Salah ends, instead of sitting and basking in the noor of Allah SWT and making dua, the muhaddithin have written that why did Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hadith that if you want the fazilat of Ishraf, you should remain seated where you are. They said that the Muhammadin said because Allah Ta'ala's nur and rahmah is coming on that person. Even when they say salam, still Allah Ta'ala puts them in the spotlight. And these are people who are enjoying the spotlight of the nur of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala that they also couldn't go. They had to tear themselves away from the masjid. That is how they should feel. How many of us feel like that? We race, we say salam, salam, and by the next salam, we are taking <laughs> off like as if we are some Olympic sprinter. <coughs> as if we are in a rush. But what happens, you can see the nifaq. We raced out of the masjid supposedly to go back to work. Second we go outside, we meet someone or we stop and we chat with them for two minutes. Then we meet another one, we talk to them for one or two minutes. Then we take a phone call, then we do an SMS. By the time we actually go, it's five, ten minutes. That person who claimed they were too busy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed that they had plenty of time. This is a sign of a diseased heart. They yearn for creation, at any time ready to have conversation with creation, but they don't yearn for the creator. Can you believe this is a thing? This I tell you, even more than I said, May yanju laka Allahi wal yawm al akhir That there are such people who are yearning to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they want to meet Allah Ta'ala so badly, they're yearning for the last day. They want Qiyamah to happen. Ya Allah, look at the quote in their Imam. Me and you would be terrified if the day of judgment was to happen. If I told you the day of judgment will happen now, you would be terrified. These people would be happy. So, but this is what we're waiting for. We're dying for the day of judgment to happen. It's Quran. How many of us have the feelings of Quran in our heart? Quran is not a book of wordings. It's not a book of recited <coughs> words only. It's not a book of meanings. It's not a book of explained meanings only. Quran al-Karim is a book of feelings. It's supposed to be a book of lived feelings. And if you recite the wordings and you explain the meanings, but you can't feel the feelings. <coughs> What is the level of Iman of such a person? So if we don't have these feelings, it is because our heart is diseased. And if our heart is diseased, we are not going to be able to control our nafs.
And the last thing for tonight, I'm going to mention some practical steps. Because we should also get some practical step by step way to control this nafs. First way, to control the nafs practically. This is called Mukhalafatun nafs. Mukhalafatun nafs means go against your nafs. Direct. Don't make any other strategy. Go in direct opposition to the unlawful wishes of your nafs. For example, you have to simply force yourself to lower your gaze. Force yourself to fast. Extra. Force yourself to come to the masjid. Go directly opposite to your nafs. Don't give in to your nafs. Don't be so nice and soft and gentle with your nafs. Mukhalafat al-nafs means stern on yourself. Some of the Mashaik used to train their students that when you sin, you should punish yourself. This has to be done with understanding and with wisdom. For example, that okay, I missed Fajr, I punished myself, I won't let myself eat breakfast until I make up that Fajr. That's a reasonable punishment, right? You have to, whenever the nafs does something that is mukhalif to Sharia, you must shoot back and do something that is mukhalif to the nafs. This is a war. This is why Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallam called this jihad al akbar Some of the ulama have referred to it as jihad al akbar This is a war. And the Prophet said, Al-Mujahidu man jahada nafsahu. In what? In ta'atillah, in the obedience of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to fight that battle. It cannot be that the nafs makes you do something against Sharia and you do nothing back to it. And the nafs will say, look at this person. Huh? I do something to them, they do nothing to me. I do more to them. Isn't that how we are? <laughs> Every time the nafs makes us do something mukhalif to Sharia, do something mukhalif to the nafs. Some of the Mashaik, they would say, I won't drink cold water. I won't do this, I won't do that. Is a punishment for my nafs. Yes, you must within reason, within wisdom, you must temper your nafs. In the Arabs, when the horses used to be wild, they used to tame the wild horse. How would they tame the wild horse? They would give it very little to eat. When they give it very little to eat, its wildness went away, but the strength remained. So we have a certain wildness in our nafs. And we have to tame that wildness. Second way is called Mujahadatul Nafs. Mujahadatul Nafs means, Mukhalifat means to go against it. Mujahadatul Nafs means to use it in ibadah. You don't, this, what does this mean? To worship, to force yourself to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you don't feel like worshipping Him at all. To make yourself do it when you feel completely lazy. That's called Mujahadatul Nafs. <coughs> You have to do that sometimes. Don't you do that for everything in this world? Any university student can never say that every time I study because I wanted to study. In fact, they will say most of the time I didn't want to study. 99% of the time I didn't want to study. But I did mujahada. I made myself do something I didn't want to do for some benefit. In that case, benefit of degree. Same thing a person who goes to work. Who can say they love their work so much, they love being there every minute? In many days they wake up, they don't want to go to work, right? But what do they do? They force themselves to do something they don't want to do. That's called mujahada. They do that for money. So we are people of mujahada. Why do you think, oh, oh, oh I can't do mujahada. I'm a weak person. You do mujahada and everything in the dunya. So again, like we said to you in Jama'ah, hey, dost, aap apne zindagi ke har har cheez ke liye mehnat mushakkat kurbani dene ke liye tiyar hai. And oh friend, you're willing to strive and work hard and make effort and sacrifice for every single thing in your life. Is it only the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you don't wish to make effort for and strive for? You have to have an element, at least an element, even some moments of mujahidah, even some few minutes of mujahidah every day. That will also control the nafs. Third way is that you must keep yourself busy when you are free. Mostly a person sins in their free time. What is free time? So you should think free time 
is when me and my nafs are alone together. That's what free time is. Otherwise, I'm busy at office, at work, in the shop, in the masjid, in the mothers, in the maktab. When is it that I do sin? When it's just me and my nafs. Then what happens? I become a partner to crime with my nafs. So this is why Allah taught us in Quran, فَإِذَا فَرَغْتَ فَنْسَمْ that when you become farig, when you become free, fansab dajja, fansab have himmat, have strength, be a firm resolve, fa ila rabbika fanha, and turn all of the inclination and yearning of your heart to Allah. Don't let yourself be free. That's what they say, right, in English. That an idle, an idle man's brain is the workshop of the devil. <laughs> yes? Don't be farig. Don't be fighting, especially for the young men. Don't ever let yourself be free. Get busy. Do something. If you cannot do ibadat all the time, do something halal recreation. Do some khidmat of deen, khidmat of khalq, khidmat of family. Do something. Never let it be that you are doing nothing. But our young men, this is what their lifestyle is. They meet one another. What are you doing? Nothing. What about you? Nothing. <laughs> They have a whole summer off in between schools. What do you do this summer? Nothing. How about you? Nothing. Love of God. Three months. Three months of your life. What did you do in the weekend? Nothing. What are you doing this weekend? Nothing. What did you do last weekend? Nothing. Ya Allah. Allah of God. No, you should say, I did nothing productive. I thought 1,000 sinful thoughts. I surfed a hundred sinful sights. I felt a hundred sinful desires. That's what you should say. <coughs> you mean you did nothing. Nobody can do nothing. Everybody does something. You did nothing of value. You did nothing of benefit. You did nothing worthy. You did everything unworthy. Always remember, anybody who says to you, I did nothing, it's not that they did nothing. They definitely did something. And if they keep telling you they do nothing, it means that not only are they doing something, they're doing everything. Yes. Say <coughs> something. That I did nothing that was worthy, I did everything that was unworthy. Don't be a person who does nothing. Occupy yourself in the halal before shaitan occupies you in the haram. Believe me, if you don't busy yourself, he's more than happy to be your event planner. Yes? He's happy to take care of your schedule for you. Your nafs is happy to take care of your schedule for you. Don't. So third way to fight your nafs is simply be busy. Simply be busy. Fourth way is to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Keep fighting and keep begging. Keep trying and keep praying. That's the ayah I mentioned in the beginning of talk. If it wasn't for the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, walawla fadlullahi alaykum. If it wasn't for the fadl, means the karam, means the grace, generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, none of you could do your tazkiyah. None of you. Abada. No single one of you could ever do it. Ya Allah. <laughs> this is the shan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is His might and majesty. Means we must keep begging Him for this tazkiyah. Don't think oh, I'm Sufi. Don't think I'm Sheikh. Nothing and no one and never can a person be successful except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must keep begging, keep praying, keep falling in sajda, keep crying our whole life until we enter into the grave. Nothing can stop us from meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not a mistake a lot of us make. But okay, fine, you made the sin. You can't do mukhalifat to nafs. You can't do mujahid to nafs. What was there to stop you from making dua? So this is one trick of shaitan, he makes you mayus. So that's why Allah Ta'ala told the sinners in Qur'an, Ya ibadi al-ladheena asrafu ala anfusina. Means if somebody says that, okay, where's the ayah in Qur'an for me? Because I'm a sinner. So Allah Ta'ala said to al-ladheena asrafu ala anfusina. Those who sinned against their own self. They gave in to their nafs. They thought impure thoughts, had impure desires. What did Allah tell the sinners? لا تقبلوا من رحمة الله. 
Don't you dare ever despair of the mercy of Allah SWT. That's what Allah SWT said. Ya Allah. It's a strong because it's nothing. It's balagha. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Don't you dare ever despair of the mercy of Allah SWT. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'ah. Allah SWT is that being who can forgive all sins entirely. Ya Allah. Allah. This Allah Ta'ala is telling the sinners, no mention that Allah Dina Asrafu al Fazam Thumba Sakfiru, no mention they did it far, no mention they did Tawbah. Just pure sinners. Allah Ta'ala is addressing them in Quran. Ya Allah. Then imagine that sinner who makes Istikfar. Imagine that sinner who makes Tawbah. Imagine that sinner who makes Dua. You will surely find that Allah's Ta'ala is a Bukhur and Rahim. Always, may always make du'a. Always make du'a. The last piece of advice is from Shaykh Ashraf al Tanvi Rehmullah Ta'ala. From this bit of Maqam. Hmm? Shaykh Ashraf al Tanvi Rehmullah Ta'ala. He said that there are three ways to do islah and nafs. Three ways that a person can rectify and correct their nafs. First way he says, Sukhma to Shaykh. What does that mean? So, what is Sukhma and what is Shaykh? Sukhma means to be in the being of someone else, to put yourself in the presence of someone else, to put yourself in the company of someone. Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan ladina amun takullaha wa kunu ma'as sadiqin. That, O oh, you who have iman, have taqwa. And simply be in the being, be present in the presence of the Sadiqin. That is called Sukhma. So that is a command Allah Ta'ala has given in Quran to each and every person who is from Ahlul Imam, who are Sadiqin. Sadiqin are those people who truly love Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and truly fear Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. They have the two master emotions in their kalb. How can I know if somebody is Sadiqin? So then that is relative to us. Anybody who truly loves and fears Allah Ta'ala more than we do, we should be in their company. That will be a benefit to us. Next question. Was Shaykh? He said, Sohbet is Shaykh. The first word I explained. Second word is Shaykh. So many times people, especially the more intellectualized ones, say, why do I need Shaykh? Okay, so your professor was your sheikh. Did you ever ask him why did you need him? Hmm? Your tutor was your sheikh. Did you ever ask him why you needed him? He says, no, but I have the Quran and Sunnah. Therefore, I don't need sheikh. Okay, let me explain to you. Quran and Sunnah is the map. And sheikh is the guide of that map. So when I came into England, I could have downloaded a map from the internet. And I could have tried to come to your masjid by the map. That would have been more difficult. Or I could have my guide who guided me here. Is it easier for me to come with a guide who guides me according to the map? He will not guide me somewhere in the wrong direction of the map. Is it easier to come to a place with a guide who guides according to the map? Or to come with the map alone? So Shaykh is not something separate from the map. Shaykh is the guide on the Qur'an and Sunnah. Still a person says that, do I really need this? Okay, I show you in Surah Fatiha, Allah Ta'ala has forced you to beg Him for it. Yes? Allah Akbar. I show you in Surah Fatiha, Allah Ta'ala has forced you, made it fard, that you must beg for it. What is the dua you make in Surah Fatiha in every rakah of Salah? That Allah SWT guide me to the straight path. What is that? Sirat al Nadina, a path of people. The path of those people. An anta alayhim, who you have sent your blessing and favor upon. You are asking Allah Ta'ala every day in Fatiha to follow people, to guide you to a path of people. And then you want to say, I only want to follow texts and not the people. It's against Fatiha. 
Anybody who tells you this, that following Qur'an and Sunnah means you don't need to follow anyone, just follow the <coughs> words, they are going against Qur'an, they are going against Surah Fatiha. Say them, what about those Al-Ladheena and Amta Alayhim? They are people. <laughs> and I'm begging Allah Ta'ala to give me hidayah towards the path of those people. And you're telling me I just need the books. You are against the Qur'an. Yes. Okay, who are those people? Allah Ta'ala explained in Qur'an. Al-Qur'an yufassiru ba'dahu ba'dah. Part of the Qur'an explains another part of Qur'an. In another ayah Allah Ta'ala said, Al-Ladheena an'am Allahu. That who are those people whom Allah Ta'ala has sent His in'am, His blessings and favors? Those ones that we were making du'a to be guided on their path. Who are those people? مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالسِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ A path of the prophets, <coughs> no longer alive today. A path of the Siddiqeen, always alive until the Day of Judgment. No longer alive on this earth, the prophets. Right? The Siddiqeen <coughs> must always remain on this earth until the Day of Judgment. They will always be true lovers of Allah Ta'ala and true followers of the Prophet with shuhada'i, also by definition, not on top of the earth, because they're the martyrs, was salihin. So in terms of our history, we follow the Nabiyyin and Sayyidina Rasulullah and the legacy and the lives of the shuhada and the martyrs. In terms of our living interaction, there are only two of the four groups left with whom we can have living interaction, and that is called Siddiqeen and Salihin. So it means that part of the du'a we make in Fatiha is Allah Ta'ala guide me to follow the path of the living Siddiqeen and Salihin. That's called shaykh. Still a person says, I still don't understand. Right? So we say, okay. In our deen, our deen is a deen of teaching and learning. كُنُوا رَبَّانِيِّينَ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تُعَلِّمُونَ تُعَلِّمُونَ الْكِتَابِ تَعْلِيمٍ تَعْلُمْ كُنُوا رَبَّانِيِّينَ means you should be the devout devotee of Allah Ta'ala by means of what you formally learn and are formally taught by Qur'an. So the teacher of Qur'an and Hadith is called an alim. Teacher of Sharia and Fiqh is called Mufti. Shaykh is the person who teaches us Taqwa, Tawbah, Sunnah, and Dhikr. That's Shaykh. So if you have a teacher for the words of Qur'an called Qali, you have a teacher of the meanings of Qur'an called Alim, to take a teacher how to feel the feelings of Qur'an, that is called Shaykh. Is that simple? So Shaykh Ashraf Ali Tanvi Rimullah who is a Shaykh in every sense of the world, well, every sense of the word, and even every sense of the world. Hmm? So we call Shaykh a Kamil. Hmm? He said that the first way of the three ways to do Islah of Nafs is Sohbat al Shaykh. Second and third, I will do with you very quickly. And that second is that you should learn from the Hasid of the Hasidi. What did he say? That when somebody envies you, somebody critiques you, somebody is against you, think that this person is not envying me on their own. Allah Ta'ala is Fa'ili Hakiki. It's like Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, they don't shoot the arrows, Allah Ta'ala shoots the arrows for them. Allah Ta'ala has placed this person to envy me. So let me listen to what he's saying. Maybe I will learn something. Allah Akbar Kazeem. Can you imagine these people were so sincere about their Islam? They said, okay, fine, he's maybe had the wrong intention. Maybe his intention is to slander. But maybe he's saying something that's correct. <laughs> I should listen, right? And that's true, the enemy today, a good, I mean, so good, a clever enemy will pick out our real faults. He won't even have to just do slander. He will target our real actual faults. Who is going to be looking at our faults with the greatest closeness is somebody who's our envy. So why not listen to him? We get a good assessment of who and what we really are. Can you imagine how much they wanted to do Islam. He said, listen to the envy of the envier. Seek refuge from their shad, min shadr hasidin dasar. But listen to what they're saying. Maybe you will learn something about yourself that you can do Islam. And the third way that he mentioned, Ajib, he said you should learn from the villat of others. <coughs> means you should learn from the downfall and disgrace of others. 
that if something happens to someone in front of you, they are exposed, they are caught, they are betrayed, they are betraying, they are disloyal. And you see how they get so stuck, how they get stuck because of their sin. You should think to yourself, that, Ya Allah, that could have been me. You are a sattar. I have just as many sins as this person. But this one, you removed your concealing veil and you unveiled him to the world and look, he is so humiliated and so disgraced. Ya Allah, that could have been me. And let me learn, take ibrat means let me learn a lesson from that. Let me fix myself now, lest I end up in their state. Allah, Allah. How concerned were these people for their Islam? This is what we want. We want to fix our nafs. We want to do islah of our nafs. If nothing else on this night, the three <coughs> major ayahs that we mentioned, Toba, Tazkiyah, and save yourself from the shuh of the nafs. And then that whole discussion of that shuh. So if nothing else on this night, we can take that first step, which is Toba. Toba is just a niyyah. Even Sayyidina Rasulullah said, A nadma, nadma toba to. That even just a feeling of remorse is toba in our heart. <coughs> so if we can make toba from our nafs on this night and then find some way to do tazkiyah on that nafs and do this mukhalifah, do this mujahidah, learn how to make dhikr, learn how to develop that kalm that will control the nafs and spend our whole life doing it. And we can also be hopeful that we can also be amongst the Muslimun. May Allah Ta'ala accept his niyyah from us tonight. May he accept our tawbah tonight. Wa akhir da'wana. And alhamdulillahi. Dabdil amin.